uh, to rethink assumptions, to challenge our own uh, understanding of what occurred and why. Um, and again, I, I, it's been a real privilege to, uh, to be a part of this. Um, and again, the, I'll, I'll restate something that was said yesterday. The biggest reason is, I, and I, I like the, 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 the way it was articulated, that the Iran-Iraq war we're, that we're conference is about today, uh, for many, many, many perspectives, is not over. And it still affects events, and it still affects U.S. policy today in ways that I think we would do ourselves a favor uh, to understand. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, to my immediate right, uh, Pisach Malavani, uh, retired colonel of the IDF, um, had, uh, my understanding is his, one of his duties over his long distinguished career was to study Iraq from afar, uh, but that was his uh, focus of attention, his professional attention. Um, as an intelligence officer, thinking about Iraq um, and, 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 and doing that, and he's just completed a study, which I can't wait to be translated into English, um, is his study of the Iraqi military over its 80, 82 year history. Um, so I'm really looking forward to his uh, comments. Um, to his right, uh, most people in the, uh, the study of Iraq and the Middle East don't need me to introduce Amatsia Baram, uh, highly pub published uh, author, uh, professor at Haifa University. Um, and again, for someone like myself who came into this rather late, uh, reading his books and papers have been uh, really important to my, uh, the beginning of my education for this process as I started to explore uh, this space. And to his right, Hal Brands, a uh, former colleague of mine at IDA. Uh, he's a history professor, uh, public policy and history professor at Duke University, has written um, uh, from the Iraqi records, has done a lot of work in the Iraqi records, and was one of the original uh, staff members of the Conflict Records Research Center as the facility was standing up. Um, and I think has a really interesting uh, paper on Saddam and uh, the Iran-Contra or Iran-Gate, as Saddam referred to it. And finally, our discussant, uh, Ambassador Richard Murphy, again, another uh, gentleman who doesn't need much introduction in this kind of audience, uh, but a scholar at the Middle East Institute, a long State Department career to include ambassadorships in Mauritania, Syria, Philippines, and Saudi Arabia, Secretary of State of the Near East and South Asian Affairs, during the Reagan administration, obviously uh, uh, a key policy uh, window into the events that we're discussing today, um, and a longtime uh, commentator on these issues uh, in the last few years. So with that, I'll start with uh, Pisach, your paper, and um, we'll try to keep it to 15 minutes uh, or less uh, per, and then go into a question and answer. Thank you very much. Just a word of, for mem of memories. The Iraq-Iran war was a surprise also for Israel, and uh, as an evidence, the Iraqi branch that I headed was established three, three months before the war started, that nobody was even thinking that something like this is going to happen, and I was asking myself what I'm going to do there. But very soon, very quickly, we find ourselves in the middle of the, of the storm. And uh, the decision, uh, one day after the, the war started, I was uh, briefing the general staff, and the decision was there that the Iraqis are going to finish the war with Iran very quickly, maybe in one week or two, and then they are going to turn le uh, to the west and come to Israel, and then the chief of staff ordered the army to get prepared for a, a, a new round against the Iraqis. Now, Saddam made uh, two main uh, decisions, I think, before the war, sta before the war uh, started. The first one was to build the military machine, and the second one to decide to go to war. Saddam was the engine in the Ba'ath regime that pushed to build and expand the Iraqi armed forces in order to obtain an impressive military power that might be used against Iraq's and the Arabs' main enemies, Iran and Israel. After the war in 73, the regime started a vast military build-up, establishing new formations, purchasing new and advanced weapon systems, and improving the training of the troops so that, quote, each of them will be worse two of the enemies. The build-up was focused mainly on Iraq's ground forces, which doubled the number of its divisions between 74 and 80. Half of the new divisions were armored, which noted that the Iraqis built an offensive and mobile army. In a very similar way, they invested also in the Air Force by purchasing new aircraft, both from the Soviet Union and France, in order to bring it up to a level that it could fight by itself against its opponents, the advanced Iranian and Israeli Air Forces. All this was not enough for Saddam, and in his vision he saw Iraq as a leading power in the area that possessed also nuclear weapons, which drove him to build the nuclear project. Iraq was the only Arab country 
at the time that built a great army that is capable, so they believed, to overcome the Iranian army that was weakened after the Islamic Revolution. The new Islamic regime in Iran posed very quickly a strategic threat to Iraq and its security, and Saddam understood that there is no way to avoid the coming war between the two sides. As such, the Iraqi leadership started to prepare the armed forces towards such a possibility and established a planning group in the general headquarters in order to assess the capabilities of the Iraqi armed forces to contend with Iran, and I think this we saw in one of the, of, of the documents here. The operational decision to go to war with Iran was made on September 6th when the Iraqis responded in a different way to the Iranian provocations and heavy bombardment of Iraqi border towns on September 4th, using this as a pretext and casus belli for going to war. Between September 6th and 21st, the Iraqis concentrated their ground forces close to the border with Iran according to their operational plans and concluded their preparations in the Air Force for the opening move of the Second Qadisiyah War, which was named after its architect Saddam Hussein. On September 17, Saddam declared the annulment of the Algeria Agreement and the return of the Shatel Arab to Iraqi sovereignty. The road to war was now open, and Iran found itself very surprisingly in a total war with its western neighbor. After the Iraqi after now I go to, to mention the, the main decisions, I think, uh, uh, during the war. After the Iraqis suffered great defeats on the southern battlefront in May 82, Saddam decided to withdraw his forces back to the international border. This decision was taken after a series of discussions at the highest level, military and party, held in an uneasy atmosphere. The Iraqis pulled back from Iranian-occupied territories still held by them, hoping that this move will convince the Iranian leadership to agree to end the war. There were commanders in the Iraqi army who opposed the withdrawal, but Saddam was decisive and told them that, quote, the decision was made and there is no return from it. Thus ended the second phase in this war that lasted 19 months in the most humiliating hours for the glorious Iraqi army in this war and in its history. In October 80, after the Battle of Khoramshahr and the beginning of the siege on Abadan, the Iraqis realized that the war will not be end soon, as they hoped. This brought them to decide to change their strategy from offense to defense, to stop the advance of their forces and take over of more Iranian territories and tightening their pressure on the Iranian cities in Khuzestan and the central sector, while further harming the Iranian fighting forces and the Iranian economic infrastructure, as so forced them to end the war. This policy was followed also after the Iraqi withdrawal to the international border in 82, when their armed forces were inferior and with low morale after their defeats in Khuzestan, while the Iranians still continued to take the offensive initiative. Saddam defined this year as the most difficult year for Iraq and its armed forces as Iraq was preparing to defend its soil and fight against an Iranian invasion into its territory. Examining their strategy in retrospect, the Iraqi's high command was satisfied by its consequences, claiming that this strategy was the main factor for their success on the battlefield since the withdrawal and that it helped them to overcome their lack of manpower and block the Iranian offensives when the ratio of manpower was 1 to 10 and even more in favor of the Iranians. In opposite to it, the Iranian offensive strategy tried to win the war by taking advantage of their manpower masses without consideration for their enormous losses. The Iraqis believed that the combination of destruction of the Ira Iranian economy with a severe damage to its human resources will bring to the end of this prolonged war. The substantial increase in manpower volume that was mobilized enabled the Iraqis to set up a huge army. Saddam personally followed the process of training and preparing them towards their integration in combat, as his slogan was that good training is the key to victory. This large volumes of manpower enabled Saddam to set up an extraordinary number of units and headquarters during the war. As far as is known, they set up at least 107 new brigades which together with existing brigades numbered about 240 brigades of all types. On this basis, they set up at least 56 new division headquarters that together with the existing division reached a total of 68 divisions at least. According to Saddam's words himself, there were at the end, in the armed forces, at the end of the war, 87 divisions of all kinds, an extraordinary number that numbered more than one million soldiers, and together with the popular army, it was even larger than one million and three hundred so, uh, uh, soldiers. To enable effective control over this large mass of forces, the Iraqis set up six new corps headquarters, in addition to the three existing, including the Republican Guard, that grew from two brigades at the outbreak of the war to 25 brigades at least at, at its end. The new army that was Saddam's private army and led Iraq to its greatest victory in this war. 
The Iranian determination to continue the war despite the Iraqi withdrawal to the international border and their massive attack on Basra in the Basra sector in July 82 led to the Iraqi decision to step up the hit and hit the oil exports of Iran, which were the main source of its revenues. That by attacking the island of Hark, from where Iran exported 85 to 90 percent of its oil produced. A new strategic aspect was added to the war, preventing the oil exports from Iran by blockading the island of Har. This was the beginning of the tanker war that was intensified during this war. In a period of a year and a half since the beginning of their blockade of the island, the Iraqi Air Force and Navy hit more than 250 vessels in the island area. And the damage to the Iranian economy, according to the Iranian oil minister, exceeded $1 billion in 1984 only. The continuous Iraqi attacks added to the aggravation in the internal situation in Iran as the damages in the oil industry brought to a widespread unemployment. Iran's prime minister even warned that his country is close to an economic disaster. These developments had an immediate impact on the global oil market by raising oil prices. Since the withdrawal of the Iraqi forces to the international border in June 82, the Iraqi population that lived along it, including in the cities of Basra and Mandalay, found itself again under Iranian artillery fire, in a speech on Army Day on January 6, 1984, Saddam warned the Iranians that further attacks against Iraqi territory and cities will be a sufficient reason to take deterrent actions against Iran. The Iranians continued their attacks and the Iraqis decided to intensify the, their air and surface-to-surface -surface attacks against Iranian targets. In March 85, the Iraqis were surprised by an Iranian air raid on Baghdad for the first time since many months, followed after a few days by SCAD missiles the Iranians received from their allies. In response, Iraq decided to operate widely against Iranian targets in the depths of Iran, including the capital Tehran, and declared the whole Iranian airspace forbidden for flights and warned all the international airline co companies not to enter it. After one of the Iranian missiles hit a school in Baghdad in October 87 and killed and injured many children, the Iraqis warned Iran that they possess a long-range missile that could hit Tehran, and they are going to use it if the Iranians will continue their missile attacks. The Iraqis fulfilled their warning on February 29, 1988, and started to launch their new El Hussein long-range missiles to, towards Tehran. It was a surprise for the whole world, but more for the Iranian regime and the population of Tehran. During a period of a month and a half, they launched about 190 missiles toward Tehran and other main Iranian cities, while the Iranians launched several dozens of missiles toward Baghdad, Mosul, and Kirkuk. This strategic blow was one of the factors that helped to convince the Iranian leadership to agree to end the war. Saddam played a major role in the liberation operations initiated by the Iraqis at the end of the war, in April, July 88. The operation to liberate the El Fau Peninsula was the first one, indicating the, its importance to the Iraqi leadership. When he understood in March 86 that his forces are not able to liberate the territory the Iranian occupied in the peninsula, he decided to stop this heavy bloodshed battle and start planning and preparing for a better battle that will achieve this goal. Since May 86, he headed 14 planning meetings with the commanders involved, uh, in this operation and made many important decisions. He also took part in the deception plan in order to convince the Iranian command that the Iraqi army is going to launch an attack in Kurdistan against an Iranian offensive at that time in the Khalabja sector. Saddam even said that it was more important to deceive the United States than the Iranians and was proud that even they didn't discover the preparations despite their intelligence satellites. During the fighting in the Khalabja sector, the Iraqi high command was concerned about the possibility of postponing this operation. Despite all this, Saddam decided on the 14th of March to continue the preparations as planned. At a meeting at a later time, he reiterated the strategic importance of this operation to liberate El Faro for Iraq and claimed that its success will bring to the collapse of the enemy and to the end of the war, and he was right. There were senior officers who thought at that time that it is more important to repel the Iranian attack in the Khalabja area, but Saddam did not accept their opinion. Saddam supervised closely this fateful battle and even intervened in its conduct by granting the Republican Guard the honor of being the liberator of the town and not the Seventh Corps as was planned. Saddam acted in a similar way in the following liberation operations, the four Tawakalna operations. In those operations, Saddam acted as a commander-in-chief of a victorious army that was at the height of its power and success. One of Iraq's important components of power during Saddam era was the military industry. 
The Iraqi leadership and especially Saddam himself were aware to the important science and technology and their contribution to build up their military power. Therefore, they invested heavily in developing their military industry and tried very hard to obtain advanced technologies, including for the development of surface-to-surface -surface missiles and weapons of mass dis destruction. An important milestone in the development of the military industry was the beginning of the development of surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Another important product of their military industry were the chemical and biological weapons. They started to develop chemical weapons after the Battle of Khormshar in October 80, when they thought that the Iranians used against their forces their a kind of chemical weapon. During the war, they used chemical weapons many times against Iranian forces and the Kurdish population. However, it seems that the use of these weapons against the Iranian forces didn't have a significant contribution to halt their offensives in the battles in which it has been used. As mentioned, Saddam was the one who decided to achieve nuclear weapons for Iraq that will enable him to create, quote, a new Middle East. The bombing of the nuclear reactor by Israel didn't affect the will of Iraq and its aspiration to obtain nuclear weapons. On the contrary, it produced a great impulse for Saddam to intensify the efforts in this project to provide, to prove the, his determination to achieve his goal, and so the Iraqis resumed their effort to obtain fissile materials for a nuclear bomb. This great dream of Saddam came to an end after his invasion to Kuwait and the, Gulf, uh, the First Gulf War. Saddam, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, was involved in decision-making in many other fields related to the military during the war. He decided about appointments and dismissals of commanders and officers on different levels, including executions of those who failed in their missions. He was encouraging the process of learning lessons by the armed forces in order to improve their fighting abilities. He decided about the cooperation with various countries in different fields, arms, arms procurement, operations, logistics, intelligence, and others. Saddam was the final arbiter on, many, on, many topi on any topic in the military as well as in other areas. He was familiar with the military and followed closely the different operations and their conduct, and in important phases he himself was present among, among his fighting forces. Saddam emerged from this war as a victor with the largest and strongest army in the Middle East and our world. All state, party, and armed forces officials praised his leadership, intelligence, and courageous decisions, which helped him to lead the country and its people on the right path that led them to status of a regional and victorious power. But this war was only the beginning of the wars of modern Babylon and its new Nebuchadnezzar, who f whose future decisions brought to the destruction of his armed forces to, and to the fall of his regime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Amatia? My uh, talk will center around two different periods. One, uh, about uh, a week, six days before Saddam invaded Iran, or one day before he announced the Iraq-Iran 75 agreement in Algiers, null and void. Uh, the discussion, which many of you may have seen, uh, I'll give you my um, uh, my suggestion what it means in a variety in about uh, six or seven different points. Then I'll deal with some of his major decisions during the war. I left the purely military ones, Pesach, who is really, uh, <laughs> he's really the great mogul of uh, the Iraqi military, uh, Iraqi military history, and I'll deal more with the political and psychological to an extent. Before that I say, I have to say something to, to my mind very important. The more I was listening, uh, having these, these uh, earphones, you know, listening at the CRRC to Saddam Hussein's decisions with his uh, generals and with his uh, party luminaries, uh, uh, the more entertained I was. Uh, and sometimes it really knocked my socks. It was like, wow. Uh, not that there are not boring parts, there they are, but my conclusion is that A, Saddam was not a clown, he was not stupid, and uh, not at all, very brilliant. Very, he didn't know much about military affairs, but he had basic common sense. And what uh, Pesach just described is also a part of this. Uh, he, he's impressed roughly in the same way, even though he sometimes made unbelievable mistakes. But at least when you listen to him, he makes a lot of sense in many cases, in most cases. Uh, sometimes it's so funny because uh, the way his psychophantic uh, luminaries are, are behaving in his, 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 in his presence is like, really, I mean, 
well, strange and funny. So, okay. And some of, his things, of the things he said are unbelievable. Uh, but on the whole, these documents, if you look at them, not just I'm an historian in the first place. I'm an intelligence officer in the second place. Uh, um, uh, and I am a political analyst in the third place, uh, contemporary. And I can tell you, it seems to me that the things that you hear and you see and you learn from those documents are very contemporary because we still have a number of, of uh, dictatorships in the Middle East, and we might have some more in the future. Uh, the big picture of the, of the discussion on the eve of his declaration that the agreement is null and void, uh, the main issues, A, the main conclusions, A, uh, the, the invasion of Iran is, is being decided upon or the declaration that the, the agreement is null and void, which may mean a war, uh, is the result not of Iraqi fears, not of Iraqi fears, much as I appreciate the importance of the Shi'i component at home. It is a pure, uh, um, uh, or almost pure, 90% pure, uh, uh, picture uh, of self-confidence. We are a superpower. The Iranians, militarily speaking, are finished. And we have to take advantage of, what, of what's going on because they provided us with legal justification to even, if necessary, go into Iran. Because they, in various ways, annulled the 75 uh, agreement. So if we declare it now ex cathedra, this is only doing it after they had done it already. So internationally speaking, we are very uh, welcome to do that. And thank you, the Iranians. Thank you, Khomeini, for doing this job for us, because now we can do it. Uh, second, uh, top priority to local Iraqi interests at the expense of Arab interests. Three, after we reach a uh, Gulf and Arab hegemony, then we shall turn to Palestine. But first, we have to be Gulf, and we will be Gulf and Arab uh, hegemons, if you wish. Number four, a huge suspicion, unbelievable, but actually now I'm saying believable, uh, uh, of the superpowers. The, the, first, the, the Russians, they will not sell us weapons. They will not sell us extra weapons, ammunition. They, they did it to us in 1974 when we fought the Kurds, did it again in 75 when we had to make concessions to the Iranians in the agreement. They'll do it again, which means we have to find other sources, but in any case, the war has to be very, very brief. It has to be a blitzkrieg, absolutely, or we are in grave danger. America. America and Israel are in cohoot with Khomeini. They brought Khomeini to power, the Americans and the Zionists. And so <laughs> trusting them is really a joke. The Arabs. The Arabs are fickle. The Arabs are treacherous. The Arabs are, you cannot rely on them. Uh, he mentions only one country, Kuwait. He did consult with them. He did tell them. And he did tell the Saudis that he was going to do something with the Iranians. But he said the Kuwaitis are even now shaking in their boots. So how can you count on these guys? So these are the main conclusions. If I don't manage to finish everything, at least you have my conclusions, my conclusions of this amazing discussion. It's truly an amazing one. Uh, the question, as I'm saying in my article, is not to invade or not to invade, or, but rather to declare or not to declare. And the very beginning, Saddam says, uh, it is my view that we should declare the agreement null and void. So you understand very well that we are not dealing here really with an open discussion, right? Uh, well, you know, he said what he thought, so that's, that's basically it. Uh, however, surprisingly enough, and I mentioned yesterday by, by, in passing, uh, 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 one person too, but especially one, uh, uh, Ali, uh, Ali Hassan al-Majid, his paternal cousin, uh, uh, called also Ali Kimyawi, chemical Ali, he is the only one who dares say something which Saddam really dislikes. And when Saddam, when he says it again, and, uh, why we sh he doesn't say we shouldn't, he's just that we should reconsider. And that's daring enough in Saddam's presence after he told you what he thought, okay? So he said, maybe we should reconsider. And the moment he says it, Saddam says to him, uh, 
يا ابو حسن ما بفهم اي دونت انديرستاند واتس جوينج اون هير يو اونلي ات ذا بيجينينج اند جاست جوينج باك فور ون سكند ان ذا بيجينينج هي سيد ذيس ديسكشن از فور يو تو تيل مي اباوت اول ذا نيجاتيف سايدز ذا داون سايدز اوف اوف ماي ايديا اوف ديكلارينج ذا اجريمنت نوت ان فويد جيف مي ذا داون سايدز سو علي حسن المجيد لايك ا جود كازين is giving him the downside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then he says, hmm, maybe we should reconsider. So Saddam looks at him and says, and you see, you hear in his voice, this anger, he's angry, he's nervous. And he's saying, why are you giving me only the downsides? Why don't you give me the more optimistic sides of this? Well, okay. So, okay, it is Saddam Hussein, but he does allow him to speak. Um, number one, Uh, the importance of international uh, agreement, absolutely important to him. Absolutely important in this discussion, very important. And I know, it, I know it from previous cases, he's discussing in 78. In 78, he's discussing uh, a war against Israel uh, with his, uh, of his military officers in the Bakr uh, 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 University for Security Studies. How is it called? Uh, 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 Bakr... And he says to them, well, uh, in 78, it's 78. It's after Sadat uh, is, uh, came back from Cap David. There is something in Israel in Egypt. He says, in two years I see a total, well, of course, Khomeini is out. He's still, still in Baghdad. Uh, Uh, I, in two years, I see another war with Israel. And he said, in that case, we have a problem, a little problem. Uh, all the Arabs who attack Israel, like Egypt, like uh, Egypt, maybe Egypt will, who knows, uh, Jordan, uh, Syria, they have a right, a right uh, demand because territory is held by Israel. But we are coming from afar. We don't have any territorial dispute with Israel. <laughs> so we were maybe regarded by the international community as we are breaching something very important. What the hell are we doing there? So the Israelis will have international legitimacy to bomb us with nuclear bombs. And Baghdad will be the first one to absorb those bombs. And he says, what do you think will be the Iraqi officer? What will the Iraqi officers do in such a case? He said, well, because the Iraqi officers are going to go home, of course, immediately to see that their families are okay, which means we cannot attack. We must, we must have a nuclear bomb. And then we threaten them, they threaten us, everything is great. So, oh my dear, this is But anyway... I'm, I'm hardy. Eventually, he says, this is very important. When he's told that maybe you should, we shouldn't buy Ali Hassan Majid, because maybe, maybe in order to secure the, 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 the waterway, which we claim is now our again, completely or more or less completely, we shall have to conquer the other bank. Then uh, he said, we are going to tread on Iranian territory, a sovereign territory. It's a problem. He said, we should talk about it tomorrow. He never, never talks about it. Uh, uh, most interesting, the most interesting thing. He believes, except for Ali Hassan al-Majid, everybody, especially Isaac Ibrahim, believes that once they tell the Iranians the agreement is done in void, and now the Shatel Arab is again ours, like it was for, since 1936, now once they do that, the Iranians will fold. And people are telling him, uh, Hassan al-Majid is telling Ali, Ali Hassan, no, Khomeini will die before he, he says okay. Uh, he, he will go to war. So he said, so he says, Saddam says, well, you know, uh, since they have no military chance at all ag against us, uh, they will have to fold because after all, Khomeini can say whatever he likes. But he says, wa iza lazim, wa iza lazim, yikunu bashar, and in, in case of need, when they realize they're just human. They're just human, which means he reads their minds the way he reads his own mind, if you understand. Because in 75, he said we were at a disadvantage. That's why we agreed to make concession on the Shatel Arab. Now they're disadvantaged, so they'll agree to make concession, because they are just like us. He doesn't understand Khomeini at all. He doesn't understand Iran at all, and so on. Uh, the um, more ambitious uh, uh, ideas, of course, it's Isaac Ibrahim who speaks... Isat Ibrahim is his master's voice. You have to understand that. He had a conversation before that with Saddam, and Saddam, that's my reading, told him, I want you to say it so it will come from you, but of course everybody will agree. Isat Ibrahim says, in 10 to 15 days we shall win the war, ta -ta -ta, like that, and then we shall become the superpower of the Gulf and of the Arab world. 
and we will achieve our goals in 15, 10 to 15 days, which would have taken us many years otherwise. So this is a wonderful idea to do. Um, it's like he said, I, I'll give you to the Arabic just the, 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 the taste of it. He said, هذا الإجراي, I mean, this measure, this measure, يعضى هو العراق بموقع تأثيري كبير, will create for us huge uh, uh, influence. هذه خطوات واسعة على الطريق تحقيق أهدافه, huge steps to achieve our goals in القطرية, الوطنية, القومية, local Iraqi, pan-Arab, and so on. Uh, and we shall build a huge army, a revolutionary army, which will se- serve as al-Quwat al-Musallah al al Arabiya, the armed forces for the Arab nation. We shall be the leader of the Arabs. Uh, we shall save a lot of time, and so on and so forth. So uh, you, ha- you see here more than just settling the accounts with Iran. It's really a much larger... Saddam and Isad Ibrahim, and all these guys, I suppose, they think big. Um, he is already leader of the leader of the Arabs, and he's talking to Begin. He's ready to talk to Begin when he's leader of the Arabs. What he'll say to Begin is another story. It's fascinating what he'll say to Begin. It's really, I mean, I, I, I was on the floor three, four times because it was so funny what he's going to say to Begin. Uh, uh, then, of course, they said the Soviets forget it, the Arabs forget it, the Americans we know exactly. Israel. And I'm an Israeli. I am very uh, interested in what he thought about us because I can tell you what I think about him, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says like, something like this. Um, uh, he said about Israel. What is he saying? He's saying the Zionists know us best. Best. Nobody knows us as well as the Ba'athis, as the Israelis. They know us so well, the Zionists. And look, they know us so well. Look how they kill us. They kill us. For two years they have been killing us, and, and the killing continues. I think, what? This is before we destroyed the nuclear reactor. What is he talking about? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know what it is. But we know them. Maybe it's my bio- biography of his, which I published and which he had uh, translated. But, that <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think so. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, inside the war. Um, and, and only one thing. There are things he's not saying about the Shia. I'll just say it. About the Shia in this discussion. Not mentioned even once. It's not that it wasn't important. It was important, of course. And I, I, I agree with uh, Yossi, who spoke it yesterday. It's important. But he says why. He says we destroyed them. And he's right. I have it both on his source and on the sources of the Shi opposition themselves, writing in Tehran after they fled to Tehran. And both he and the Shia opposition, Adawa, are saying Saddam destroyed us completely. So, yes, long term it may become a problem, but right now they are not a problem. We finished that problem. So you don't, they don't, you don't feel that they have any threat at them, not at all. In fact, also, it's not bon ton to talk about the Shia. It's not bon ton. And uh, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a taboo. So that also in hinders them, even if it's the most secret discussion and so on. My conclusion, if you look at that, and if you look at wartime decisions, which I did as well, you feel something very strange. Because the Shia didn't like the war, but their opposition to the war, except for very, very small action activities, very little uh, real military activity against the regime, uh, they felt that they won the Shia over. And when the war is over, Saddam is telling uh, his uh, luminaries, again, a small meeting, and said, look, Khomeini says that my people, that I'm detached from my, my, my people. Ma'azul, yani, ma'azul and shabi. He said, I'm not ma'azul, I'm not detached, he is detached. I, I suggest to have a competition. The Iraqi Shia will have a perfectly democratic public opinion poll about me, and the Iranians will have a perfectly democratic public opinion poll about Khomeini, and see if I don't get 100%, and he'll fail. So you think, my God, where is he living? This f- sense of security, not total, but to a large extent, is going through the war, and at the end of the war, when, if you remember, after the war, after you guys knocked him out in Kuwait, there is a, a huge public uh, 
uh, really shabby uh, public revolt in the South. The South is on fire, the Shi South. He admits in a closed meeting, we were totally taken by surprise. Totally. We thought they loved us. And that is a total uh, uh, surprise. My conclusion, because it's taboo, it's not nice, eventually you talk about it a lot after the revolt, but in the war very little, they tended to think that things look more or less okay, and the Shi opposition was very passive, I can describe how it does better right now, that the result is that they didn't pay enough attention to public moods amongst the, the Shi uh, citizens, and this hits them very hard in 1991 in March, and I think that the revolt in the South was more dangerous to the regime. Uh, uh, General Juburi will tell us if it's true or not, but my conclusion is, and also look at what they are saying, that the 1991 revolt against them after they lost the war to America and lost so many troops and so on, is so traumatic. It's more traumatic than the war against America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hal. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just a couple of prefatory comments. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, I am a, a CRC alum, so it's great to see what David and Lori have, have, and their staff have done in terms of getting the whole thing up and off the ground, and hopefully this will be the, the first of many conferences to, to draw on these materials. Uh, second, uh, Amatsia briefly mentioned uh, a couple of some of what I think are the most fascinating documents in the archive, and it's in the period between about 78 and 81 when Saddam is talking about what Iraq is going to do vis-a-vis -vis Israel when it finally gets nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's really interesting because he's talking about using nuclear weapons to create sort of a stable deterrent at the nuclear level so they can wage conventional war against Israel. Uh, and his confidence that Iraq could win an, a conventional war was probably somewhat misplaced, but uh, he was very much convinced of this. And uh, David Palk and I did an article where we dress some of this stuff up in political science language. Uh, but for those of you who get over to the CRC, I, I highly recommend those, those documents. So uh, my paper today deals with Saddam's diplomatic decision making during the war, and particularly his relations with the US. Uh, we know quite a bit about the US views of the wartime relationship through the work of Malcolm Byrne and Bruce Jenelson and others. So my paper uses the new Iraqi records and some other sources to look at Saddam's side of the affair. Uh, so I ask questions like, how did Saddam view his dealings with Washington, uh, what tactics did he use to elicit and maintain American support, uh, what lessons did he take away from the experience. Uh, and just to, to give you a preview of the conclusion, uh, what emerges is that there's really a striking duality to Saddam's uh, wartime relations with Washington. So on the one hand, we see sort of Saddam the ultimate pragmatist. Uh, this is a guy who very early on saw the value of American support uh, and used a mix of, of cunning, cleverness, uh, and even some conciliation to facilitate that support. But on the other hand, we also see that Saddam maintained throughout the 1980s uh, really a, a bitter and intense sort of wariness and hostility toward the United States, so much so that he emerged from the war seeing uh, America as a major threat to his regime. So to understand how Saddam could hold both of these views, it's useful to know a little bit about his pre-war perceptions of the United States. So for long before the, the 1980 invasion, Saddam had viewed the United States as a power that was basically unfriendly to the Ba'athist revolution. This was something that came from Ba'athist ideology. It was something that came from Saddam's tendency to see a Western or Israeli conspiracy in every misfortune. Uh, it was something that came from his, in what was in a lot of ways, a remarkably self-centered worldview, uh, and from other personal characteristics as well. And it should be added, it was also something that came from hard experience, because uh, Saddam well knew the United States had sought during the early 1970s to undermine the Ba'athist regime by aiding the Kurdish insurgents in the north. So throughout the 70s, Saddam was prone to see sort of the hidden hand of America in, in pretty much everything that happened in the Gulf. And my favorite example uh, referenced by Amatsia was that in one of the documents released today, uh, he seems convinced that the United States had somehow masterminded the Iranian Revolution uh, and even perhaps the hostage crisis uh, in order to improve its position in the region vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf states. So at the same time, Saddam could be remarkably pragmatic uh, and opportunistic in dealing with Washington. So after his relations with Moscow soured during the mid-70s, uh, Saddam turns to the United States for greater commercial ties. Uh, after the Iranian Revolution and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, there is even some talk of forging closer diplomatic or military relations with Washington. Uh, and the details of this last part are still quite murky, but it looks like Saddam actually availed himself of American medical expertise in the late 70s 
because he secretly asked the Carter administration to send some doctors to Baghdad to retreat. Uh, I guess it was probably his back ailment. His and, spine, yes. Yeah, in 1977 or 78. It I looks, met, it I looks met like, doctor. Yeah, it looks like Carter agreed. So, yeah, yeah, so the, the doctor the, went yeah, there. Yeah. The key point uh, here is that hostility and opportunism could easily coexist in Saddam's views in the United States. Right? So the same pattern persists during the Iran-Iraq War. Saddam was never comfortable about his wartime alliance with Washington, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but he definitely realized it was very useful. Uh, now, I should say that the effect of U.S. support for Iraq has often been exaggerated in the, the scholarly and popular literature. But it's clear that the Iraqi government did derive some real utility from uh, things like American loan guarantees, intelligence sharing, diplomatic pressure, and eventually military pressure on Iran and so forth. And Saddam realized all this early on. So from early 1981, really from about February and March onward, uh, his diplomats repeatedly called on the United States to exert more pressure on Iran to stop the war. Uh, and while Saddam and his subordinates usually didn't like to ask explicitly for more concrete American assistance, uh, they definitely hinted on, on various occasions that more uh, loan guarantees, dual-use exports, uh, and other sorts of aid would be greatly appreciated. Now, the key thing to appreciate here is that Saddam and his subordinates could, could actually be fairly flexible uh, in dealing with the United States. Right? So Saddam, for instance, he tones down his normally vitriolic rhetoric toward the United States during the 1980s for the most part. Uh, he takes a more moderate stand on Arab-Israeli issues. Uh, he allows some strikingly intimate ties between U.S. and Iraqi intelligence. Uh, there are about 60 DIA analysts in Iraq by the end of the war. Uh, and to improve Iraq's image in the United States, the, the government gives preferential treatment to U.S. academics and policy wonks. So people from uh, Brookings, NDU, and other think tanks are brought to the Iraqi embassy, and on some occasions to Baghdad itself for interviews with top regime officials. Uh, and if, if you read sort of the, the literature on Iraq that's written during the mid-1980s by some of these folks, it, it appears that you know, these efforts had the desired effect. Uh, now, these were hardly the only ways in which Saddam sought to cultivate uh, his relations with the United States. Uh, his representatives in Washington, they actively worked the U.S. legislative process. They hired lobbyists to make the case that commerce with Iraq would benefit uh, agricultural, industrial, and financial interests in the United States. Uh, Saddam clearly paid attention to the importance of uh, increasing bilateral economic ties as a way of raising the costs of any U.S. decision to cease supporting Baghdad. So you can see this in the pattern of Iraqi oil exports during the war, uh, which grew from basically nothing in 1982 to about 125 million barrels a few years later, with U.S. purchasers receiving uh, a dollar per barrel discount. And the wisdom of this policy became evident during the congressional debate on whether to impose sanctions on Iraq after the gassing of the Kurds in 88, uh, as oil industry representatives and other special interests quickly mobilized to weigh in against any real punitive action. Uh, and I think we can even see Saddam's decision to expand the war into the Gulf in the mid-'80s uh, as part of a campaign to win additional foreign and especially American assistance. So there, there's no doubt, uh, as Kevin and others have pointed out, that Saddam sincerely believed that waging economic warfare would be beneficial mil militarily. Uh, but he also seems to have hoped that the attacks would goad the Iranians into doing something drastic that would endanger Gulf oil flows uh, and thereby force Washington and potentially other powers to, to intervene. So Saddam had repeatedly commented that if the United States really wanted to end the war, it could. Uh, and he certainly recognized that a U.S.-Iranian confrontation would only help Iraq. Uh, and sure enough, when that confrontation occurred in 1987-88, uh, the Iraqi foreign ministry reversed its earlier position and basically tacitly gave its blessing to uh, the presence of U.S. naval forces in the Gulf. So this is sort of one side of Saddam's wartime relationship with the United States. This is the pragmatic, manipulative, uh, and even somewhat <coughs> conciliatory side. But there's also uh, another side of the relationship, one that was far more hostile and distrustful. So even as Saddam is benefiting <coughs> from American assistance during the 1980s, he reels off this r remarkable list of accusations against the United States, mostly in private but occasionally in public. So just to list a few things, uh, he charges that American AWACS are spying on Iraq and passing the info to Iran. Uh, he charges that the United States was behind the attack on Osirak in 1981. He charges that uh, declining gasoline prices represent an international conspiracy to harm the regime. Uh, he argues that the very tepid U.S. criticism of Iraqi chemical weapons usage in 1984 was part of a secret alliance between Reagan and Khomeini. Uh, he alleges that the United States is purposefully feeding Iraq faulty intelligence to weaken its position on the battlefield. Uh, he argues that Washington was uh, using its naval actions against Iran in the Gulf in 87-88 to distract the world from uh, Iraq's glorious military triumphs at the end of the war. 
Uh, and there was one meeting just after the close of the fighting where Saddam flat out alleges that the United States is undermining and perhaps trying to overthrow his government, and he even seems to assert that Washington had recently tried to have him assassinated. So throughout the war, uh, Saddam is convinced not just that long-term U.S. and Iraqi interests diverged, but that Washington was actively working to bring him misfortune. Okay, so why did Saddam take such a dark view of U.S. policy? Uh, part of the answer almost certainly has to do with personality, um, particularly Saddam's long-standing mistrust of the United States, uh, his penchant for conspiracy thinking, uh, his unwillingness to accept responsibility for Iraqi setbacks. So just to give you an example, when Saddam's forces are, are driven off the Fowl Peninsula in early 1986, he immediately jumps to the conclusion that the United States had deliberately provided his analysts with misleading intelligence, uh, rather than considering that the information was simply mistaken or that the defeat was the result of subpar uh, Iraqi performance or intelligence gathering. Uh, and various other instances testify to the same basic characteristics. So, so personality is clearly part of the issue, um, but you can't simply chalk up Saddam's fears to ideology or irrationality, um, because Saddam was, was no fool. He understood that the Reagan administration didn't actually want Iraq to win the war. They just wanted uh, the Iranians not to win. Uh, and so Henry Kissinger and various people in the Reagan administration were saying, usually off the record, that it's a shame both countries can't lose. Uh, the Iraqi Foreign Ministry duly reported these comments back to Baghdad. So it wasn't entirely unreasonable for Saddam to think that the United States might actually be balancing its support for Iraq with assistance to Iran as well. Uh, and this is what Saddam was getting at in this comment that he makes to Donald Rumsfeld in 1983 when he says that American policy was, quote, to let this group of lunatics bash each other. Uh, and as it happened, Saddam was, he was partially correct in his suspicions, uh, which the, uh, the Iran-Contra scandal showed when it broke in late 86. I won't go into the details here, but uh, in public, Saddam's response to the scandal was, was fairly restrained because he recognized that uh, his regime couldn't afford a full break with the United States. But in private, uh, Iran-Gate, as, as Saddam called it, which is, which is interesting because he, he couldn't care less about the Contra aspect of, of Iran-Contra, uh, it had a major impact on his views of the relationship with Washington. Uh, and it really shouldn't be surprising when you think about it because it's really difficult to imagine anything the Reagan administration could have done that would have been better suited to reinforcing Saddam's worst suspicions about the United States, right? So the arms sales strengthened Iran at a time when Saddam was fighting for his political life, and they involved the trilateral, con trilateral conspiracy involving the United States, Iran, and Israel. Uh, so just to, to draw sort of a, a facile analogy, it's almost as though Stalin had discovered in 1943 that the United States was sheriting sharing a limited amount of arms and information with Hitler. Right? So what's very clear in several of the documents that flow out of this is that Iran Gate sort of served for Saddam as, as the conclusive proof that everything he had always suspected about the United States was true. Uh, he refers to the arms sales as the stab in the back, uh, and as Tariq Aziz later put it, the whole episode convinced Saddam, quote, that Washington could not be trusted and was out to get him personally. So there, there's this great irony of U.S. policy toward Iraq during the war. We, we set out to reassure Saddam, but our actions have precisely the opposite result. Uh, and I won't elaborate much on this, but the, these suspicions stuck with Saddam through the end of the war and after. So during 87, 88, Saddam is convinced that the United States had never stopped passing intel to Iran. Uh, and so even as Iraqi forces are using American intel to plan their offensives in early 88, uh, they're also designing deception plans meant to confuse mainly American intelligence, our satellites, as to Iraq's intentions on the battlefield. Uh, and this goes on and on. And, and even into 89 and 90, as Saddam's uh, economic and political problems are worsening, uh, he regularly alleges in private that the United States is behind these problems, and he often refers back to Iran Gate as evidence that Iraq was, I'm sorry, that Washington was out to undermine his government. So this perception of uh, American treachery was something that very much stuck with Saddam after the war ended. Uh, so just to make a couple of concluding comments, um, there's, to sort of link this up with, with some of the stuff that's been written on the Iran-Iraq war and U.S. policy, there's a large school of thought out there that, that criticizes U.S. policy for being far too accommodating of Saddam during the 1980s. Uh, and this is, is certainly a fair critique, at least in some ways. But it's essential to sort of do what Kevin was talking about and get on the other side of the hill and see that Saddam really didn't see things that way. So throughout the 80s, he continued to expect hostility and, and deception from the United States, even as he received American support. Uh, this was partially because of his worldview, but it was partially because of the reality of American policy in the Gulf. 
So, and this comes in, is where the title of my paper comes in. Saddam saw the Americans as, as sort of necessary wartime partners, but as he commented in 86, I think, uh, they were still conspiring bastards as well. Now, the finding is, is interesting in its own right because it, it illustrates that this, uh, there was this duality that I've been talking about to Saddam's wartime views of the United States. Uh, but I think it's also interesting because it, it may tell us that we need to rethink some of our longstanding assumptions about U.S.-Iraq relations during this period. Again, there's a substantial body uh, of thought out there that one of the reasons Saddam invaded Kuwait in 1990 is because the United States had somehow convinced him during the Iran-Iraq war that it would treat him with great forbearance, that he could get away with, with all manner of outrages. Uh, now, this may partially be true, but some of the findings that I've talked about here uh, and some of the things I've developed in, along with David Polky uh, indicate that uh, Saddam's views of the United States probably weren't quite so simple as this would make out. So we may be wise to consider alternative explanations as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Um, I neglected uh, Dr. Malavoni had uh, – uh, Colonel Malavoni had asked to be able to show some photographs associated with his talk. So I'd like to see in a couple of couple of minutes from the end. Um, I'm let him watching give the, the scenes of the first Cadizia and the second Cadizia battles. You see the, the cavalry is the first Cadizia of the seventh century, and the tanks, the armor of the second. This is the build-up of the Iraqi armed forces before the war. And here is visiting one of his armor divisions, the 10th division in uh, uh, Taji before uh, its operation, it started operations in the war, and uh, these are the Iraqi soldiers uh, uh, after the uh, uh, conquest of, uh, of the enclave there. Saddam is visiting his uh, forward units. Here we say with the helmet in the area of Abadan. This is in the forward headquarters of the 9th division uh, during the Battle of Khafajia in, Yano in January uh, 81. And here he is with his friend uh, Hussein, King Hussein, in the central sector watching what's going on. And here also after the withdrawal in the Amara area. Here he is uh, consulting with his generals. You can see here the Chief of Staff, General Shamshal, Adnan Khairallah, and all the other Corps commanders and Air Force commanders about the situation. This is the building of forces during the war. Here, here we see the second armored brigade of the Republican Guard when it finished it, when it finished its uh, training. And this is another uh, regular uh, army brigade, armored brigade parading vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis him. And the, the Mirage F1, as it was mentioned before. This is the island of Harj, which the Iraqis bombed several times in order to prevent the Iranians from uh, uh, exporting their oil. And this is a very nice picture of an uh, 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 Iraqi uh, missile boat launching uh, one of its missiles and hitting uh, uh, one of those many ships. These are the, uh, uh, the elements of the war of the cities. The use of the air force at the beginning and then the long-range missiles they uh, uh, developed, the El Hussein and the El Abbas. This is an interesting thing. They uh, uh, announced uh, the places, they, they published maps of Iran with the places they are going to bomb the next day so the uh, population, the Iran population can evacuate them before, uh, not, going, uh, not getting ma many losses. Here uh, at the planning and, uh, op uh, of the uh, best Ramadan operation uh, to liberate uh, El Fao, the, in here is with his chief of staff, deputy, chief of intelligence, and Hussein Kamel, deciding the D-Day and H-Hour. This is one of the planning uh, uh, meetings, and this is after the uh, operation was successful with uh, General Maher, the 7th Corps commander, and General Rawi, the Republican Guard commander. These are the uh, uh, development of the uh, military industry, the El Abed missile, a, a double stage uh, system that fa actually failed, and this is one, the, the, actually the Iraqi, uh, uh, let's say, call it so, the Iraqi AWACS airplane. Yes. This is the Oziraq, the Iraqi uh, 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 reactor after the visit of the Israeli uh, Air Force. <laughs> and here you can see the commander in chief in action showing on the map and his uh, f fantasies to uh, be the descendant of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and he again, with, this is, uh, uh, with his deputies after the Karbala 5 uh, uh, operations that failed, and here with the chief of uh, uh, staff, General Danun, chief of intelligence, 
General Mahmoud Chokr Shaheen, who was uh, dismissed after, because of the failure to, uh, of the FAO uh, occupation by the Iranians and Hussein Kamel, here with uh, two uh, leading field generals, General Saad Itum Abbas, who was Defense Minister in 91, and General Hisham Sabah al-Fakhri, who were leading the Iraqi forces during the FAO uh, uh, battles, and here with General Rawi in one of the operations at the end of the war. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ambassador? Well, I congratulate the panelists for their papers and the team that's done so much spade work getting the documents together. Uh, I felt on reading the ones that were uh, distributed to us before, we have to treat them with caution. It's a limited selection, and our evaluations may well uh, change as more and more of the documents are processed. Uh, just a reflection on the war from the perspective of uh, the front office in my bureau in Near East and South Asian Affairs in state. Uh, we ran what was known in the Department of State as the Low Rent District. That's somewhere, something in that area is always going wrong and usually very bloodily had to deal with Gaddafi, the Lebanese Civil War, the Israeli-Palestinian head-ons, uh, the Soviets in Afghanistan, the rebels in Sri Lanka, the Pakistan-Indian tensions. It was, it was quite a crowd. The question is, how much credit or blame does Saddam deserve for his country's and his military's conduct of the war? And I. I feel we still haven't come to grips uh, with that issue. Colonel Malavani's paper very usefully tracks the Iraqi progress in building the military force, mobilizing resources. Uh, did that bring the end of the war? The one incident which we focused on uh, at the end of the war was the USS Vincennes and that finally that had pushed Khomeini into deciding to end the war, that he could not have an active war going with the United States. I don't know, maybe he was conditioned, maybe Iran really was exhausted and he knew the time had come and used the Vincennes as, a, uh, uh, as an excuse to stop it. The casualty count by then was appalling on both sides. The early documents that we were provided with, shows a leader that could only be described as having fairly serious attention deficit disorder. In that one meeting, he was hopping around from uh, very detailed, precise questions on the weapons and casualties to asserting the, that Arafat uh, and the Syrians are bluffers, Algeria has no right to get into a mediating role. By the way, yes, let's destroy the decrepit houses in Baghdad. They're an eyesore. Uh, and cancel the oil agreement with Athens. They've been uh, discourteous. Indira Gandhi is shameless. Uh, and Israel's going to attack us before it attacks either Damascus or Amman. I mean, what, what sort of profile does that give us uh, of a leader? The, uh, he was receiving advice from his chief of staff, army chief of staff, that you know, we should organize to increase enemy losses. Well, that suggests that there was a couple of major deficiencies on the part of the senior staff. I mean, it seems kind of obvious. As was been noted, Saddam sometimes invited uh, and said he invited comments, invited cr reactions, even criticism. More often, he was in overdrive revealing his wisdom. The Ba'ath Party had become his microphone to the country at large. Um, well, another document underlined for me his uh, tendency to focus in excessive detail. He wanted to distribute 15 bravery medals, four supercars, 15 Brazilian cars kind of a slap at the Brazilian automobile industry for bravery. And 
I would think that kind of personality trait where he gets down to the level of how much the first corps should be rewarded in terms of bravery medals just it'll it'll be uh, it'll be right to give them 15 bravery medals in the supercars now other leaders can go through their moments of bizarre focus i i recall our president and cabinet members in the Situation Room discussing the Lebanese Civil War and platoon displacements in the Shouf area where they had just been introduced uh, to the issue about five minutes before. So it's not totally unknown. But um, And the papers do furnish ample examples of his fondness for conspiracy theories, to which he had every right, given the way we, the Israelis, and the Iranians had organized the Kurdish rebellion uh, back in the mid-70s. Um, but did it help his leadership and his decision-making process to dwell on the fact, uh, in his views, that it was the Jews it wasn't Zionism, it wasn't Israel, it was the Jews who were guiding Iranian policy that America shares in that alliance and the UN Secretary General is a party to the conspiracy. Did that distort his decision making on the battlefield? I don't think the documents give us a clear answer one way or the other on that. Uh, um, he missed, and this is a point that Amatsia makes very well in his paper, he missed one essential difference between Iraq and Iran, saying that Iraq was going to triumph through calculation. He missed the fact that Iran was not operating on strict rational calculations. It was drawing on the deep fund of energy of a revolution, which he, Saddam, had never been through. He had been through a coup d'etat, very expertly managed, but not through his revolution, not, not through a revolution. And that Khomeini was able to carry on for years drawing on that sense of a new social order in Iran. Um, I think he also totally underestimated the degree of obsession in our White House over the Beirut hostages. Albrandt makes the point that the significance of military sales to Iran had less to do with any desire to aid the Iranian war effort than with Reagan's hope to get Tehran's assistance in freeing the Beirut hostages. I, I personally think that uh, uh, our assistance to Iran had nothing to do with helping the Iranian war effort. It was all directed at the assumption it would somehow get the hostages out. There was an interest in establishing more normal relations, if possible, with restoring something with Iran, as there was from the beginning in 84 when we resumed diplomatic relations with Iraq. Maybe something could be built. Irangate did confirm his suspicions of us, uh, and he showed an interesting mix of cynicism, sophistication, and anger in his reaction. He tells his staff in one meeting, don't criticize the Soviets, they act like big powers do. And an anecdote from the meeting I had with him, uh, with David Newton, I believe in 86, where he sat back and said, uh, there were just Saddam, his interpreter, and Tariq Aziz with us, that you know America treats the third world the way an Iraqi peasant treats a new wife. <laughs> dead silence. So I filled it in saying, oh. <laughs> oh, yes. Three days of tea and honey and then off to the fields for life. Well, that's not, not uh, a total truth, but uh, there's something to it. <laughs> well, Hal has written that we were strange bedfellows with Saddam in the 80s. No one I worked with romanticized the relationship. We were pleased to see Iraq restore relations. It was the last Arab country that had cut relations back in 67 to do so. Uh, we learned, I believe from Nizar, or maybe it was from Tariq Aziz, that about the decision to resume relations had been taken in 82, but Saddam said, we will not renew until we are doing better on the battlefield. I don't want it to appear 
like I am acting out of weakness in going back into a relationship with the United States. Um, yes, our resumption of relations and our efforts with Iraq did reflect a steady push from friends such as King Hussein, uh, King Fahad, and the Saudis that Saddam had changed. His experiences in the war had been searing to him, and after the war we would see him devote his energies to the peaceful improvement of his own people's lives. Even after Operation Staunch and our furnishing a good deal of information about the Iranian order of battle, supplying dual-use items, the Iraqis never really, in my opinion, and from some of the field people in the agency that I talked to, never fully reciprocated. They didn't open the, the treasures of what was uh, what the Iraqis might have known. Uh, DOD, CIA can better answer the question of how much help we really gave. I'd be interested in the panel's reaction to the valuation by the Iraqis of the value of, uh, value of U.S. as opposed to Soviet uh, supplied intelligence. As I said yesterday, the at the working level, uh, or rather this morning, that there were no voices saying we should let the fighting continue until the two bled themselves white. We were worried about it spreading and the evidence of Iranian subversion, sabotage in Kuwait, efforts in Bahrain, uh, in the UAE were in front of us. Uh, and We didn't want to see the Gulf states sucked into the, the conflict. But I don't dispute the fact that the Iranian attacks on the oil tankers were the direct cause of our getting into that very bizarre exercise of reflagging the Kuwaiti tankers uh, so that our Navy could escort them in and out of the Gulf. Uh, that um, was an echo of uh, Cold War thinking that uh, was behind testimonies I gave to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I think in 87, that uh, re recall the words of Catherine the Great even, saying that we should keep the Russian troops from washing their feet in the warm waters of the Gulf. It's a little embarrassing looking back since three years later the Soviet Union had collapsed, but we were still flogging that horse and believing it. Um, our support... Our escort service, no, not escort service, our <laughs> convoy, convoy duties uh, did oh, add weight it. to the already what had been a steady pitch from the Defense Department to get approval of a forward operating headquarters in Saudi Arabia uh, or elsewhere in the GC, but they were focused on the Saudis. And our presence there, of course, became the flashpoint uh, for Osama bin Laden in the wake of the first Gulf War. Uh, that we had taken possession of the Holy Land um, and renewed, or reminded the Saudis they'd been right all along not to have us uh, present militarily in their own country. So I would be interested in the panel's reactions uh, to U.S.-Soviet intelligence value and also in the Israeli... Uh, role in sh sharing with the U.S. before and during the war their views and their necessity of American action vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. But again, the basic question of the panel was supposed, is supposed to be how did all of this affect his military decision-making? And I think that question remains to be answered. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I appreciate it. Uh, well, well, since the ambassador asked two questions about uh, the reactions of the panel. We'll take them quickly if we can, since it was the panel before, brought up some really interesting points about information sharing outside of the U.S.-Iraq relationship. Um, uh, comments, thoughts on uh, intel sharing, uh, the effect of intel sharing, the relationships that you saw, how maybe in the documents, yeah. or intel sharing maybe the, from the Israeli point of view, uh, trying to influence the situation from their strategic point of view of the U.S. in the early 80s. Uh, my, my sense is that it's very difficult to disaggregate the effect of intelligence that the United States provided from 
all of the other sources of intel that the, the Iraqis were bringing to bear. I mean, Kevin, as, as you point out in your Iran-Iraq war book, the Iraqis had a really terrific SIGINT capability, uh, and they were relying on that quite heavily as the war went on. The, they had a lot of help from the Soviets in terms of getting sort of tactical intelligence using the MiGs. Uh, they were getting other forms of intel from the Soviets, and, and I think probably from the French as well. So it's uh, my, my sense is that uh, American intel was certainly helpful, but it, it, it's really just sort of a, a moderately sized piece of a much bigger puzzle. Um, what, one other comment. When you were talking about the, the transcript, transcript where Saddam is talking about the Israelis have been killing us for two years, uh, my interpretation is that he's actually talking about Israeli covert efforts to disrupt the Iraqi nuclear program. Yes. Um, I don't know, Kevin, what's, is that your reading? Well, I, I, that, that was the first interpretation. The other one was that he was just kind of projecting the larger conspiracy idea that whatever the Persians are doing is because there's an Israeli hand right. in the puppet, you know, kind of making things happen. Because there had so. been, I guess, a couple of uh, nuclear scientists in Iraq's employ. I think they were actually Egyptians who were rubbed out during the 79, 80 period. Yeah. And he, certainly, not, the he tape, certainly blamed it, Israel for it's it. It's conversational, so the tape isn't clear. It's not like it's a document. You don't, you don't really know what he's But it was not to. my biography of his. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, no, anything on the Israeli uh, influences in that period? I mean, outside of Israel's own concerns, but I mean, as far as influencing the situation with the U.S.? Look, Israel was concerned at the beginning, as I mentioned, uh, that the war will be very short and he might come with all his force uh, toward us. Later, when it was learned that he was stuck in this uh, attrition war, the interest in uh, what was going on there was uh, deteriorating until he started to use the chemical weapons. And later, of course, uh, long-range missiles, which, of course, we saw it as a threat, and it uh, uh, implemented in uh, the 1991 uh, war, of course. And uh, also, after the 88, after 88, after the war was finished, uh, he uh, uh, put more efforts in order to develop those uh, non-conventional uh, weapons, and we find out also that he's renewing the nuclear uh, project again in a different way, and all this, of course, uh, was a, for a great, of a great worry for, uh, for us. Uh, but uh, when he was, uh, during the wars, from, uh, I would say, 81 till uh, 86, 87, uh, the, inter the, the idea was, uh, we shared it also with the with, uh, United States uh, authorities, I believe, that uh, this war is, ne is never going to end. Nobody was really knowing uh, what will happen, and uh, nobody was uh, really uh, t taking into uh, assess that uh, in one day uh, as Saddam will initiate his uh, take the initiative again, and uh, the Iraqis will uh, do what they did in the three months of uh, the victory operations, and by this and and also using the the weapons, the, the long-range missiles against Iran. Uh, and the chemical attacks bringing to the end of the war in uh, August uh, 88. Maybe I can say something about it. Uh, I was uh, one notch below Pesach, but Pesach was not my commander at the time. Anyway, I saw, yes, we got from America some information about the Iran-Iraq war. I did see that. I have no uh, useful. I, d I don't have any clue what we provided America with. That was one or two or three notches above my pay grade. Uh, uh, something about the reactor. What caught my eye and my ear uh, was a discussion uh, in the Iraqi elite after the destruction of the, of the, of the Tammuz or uh, Ozirak reactor. Right after, a few days. And all these guys are meeting and talking about the diplomatic things and so on. Saddam is telling them, my answer to begging will be that we shall rebuild our nuclear industry. Every, uh, every lesson serves us for action. And we drew the lesson, uh, which means we are now going to disperse. I am looking and waiting and sort of listening carefully. Somebody said, what shall we be doing for these horrible Zionists? Now they really killed us, right? And nobody is asking. Saddam is not saying anything. I can tell you, because I was in Jerusalem at the time, that uh, I heard the Israeli Air Force uh, planes above my head 24 hours a day 
waiting for an Iraqi reaction. Iraqi reaction never came. Well, 1991 is a different story altogether, but anyway. And this uh, demonstrates to me and the discussion too, there is no threat of revenge. And you know how al-intaqam, yani revenge, is important in Middle Eastern uh, p- uh, society. Nothing. I see this as a sign of, of great pragmatism uh, on Saddam's part. We are not going to open a second front. No way. It was 1981. They were in deep trouble in Khoram Shah and Abadan. Forget it. So this way, about what you provided them, I can only quote Patrick Lang. And I'm, I hoped that he would be coming here, but he is a very uh, private man, so he <laughs> doesn't want to open his mouth too much. But from Patrick Lang, I know that when he was there, the Iraqis wanted his advice about practically everything. They trusted him. And what he said is... You know, another thing that was also very interesting, uh, right on the day of the ceasefire, 20th of uh, August 1988, the uh, Pentagon pulled him back immediately. And the Iraqis said, what is this? You don't love us at all? And he said, Washington is pulling me back. In his view, the Iraqis saw as if they needed it, Another sign of American, uh, you know, um, you cannot rely on the Americans. One remark. Okay, and then we'll get to questions real yes. quick. Just a, a, a memory. I was here in Washington with some of my people in the end of 88 to discuss with the uh, United States authorities, CIA, DIA, about the renewal of the nuclear uh, project in uh, Iraq. And we were sitting the whole day and discussing, and we showed them all the information we had. And at the end, they told us that Nothing is going on there. They don't have any information about it. I was so much Im- disappointed that I, I didn't know what to think. Or they have the information they don't want to tell, you, tell us. Or they really don't have nothing. And it was, it was very astonishing for me that the United States doesn't know at, le- at least something that we also uh, collected. But uh, after uh, several months, they uh, contact us and say, yes, we have uh, the more or less the same signals that you have, and uh, we are now going to get into it uh, much more deeper. Thank you. What I'd like to do is take maybe like two questions at a time, give them a chance to think, and then we'll just, I'll just kind of go around the room if I can get the mics to move, because I'm not as familiar with everybody's names. Uh, right here, Pierre, and then Ambassador. Yes, sir. I'm at his, uh, don't you think that the answer... Name, name please. I'm sorry. Uh, say your name and affiliation. Pierre and Razou, uh, NATO Defense College. Uh, don't you think that the answer of uh, Saddam uh, was about the war in Lebanon, which the war in Lebanon, which means that there were, including in the tales, in the tapes, uh, different theory about the fact that Abu Nidal could have been, could have killed, uh, could have killed uh, the, Is- the Israeli ambassador to London, and that it was let's say, guided by uh, by Saddam, and so. So, why do you think of that? Uh, uh, what month was that? This was in June uh, '82. As I mentioned, he was just after the uh, great defeat in Khuzestan, and he was looking for every mean in order to bring this war to an end. And he, one of the decisions, as I mentioned, was to the withdrawal to the border, and the second one to ignite another war in the Middle East and to persuade the Iranians. And he said it few days after that to persuade the Iranians to finish the war between them and to get the Iranian army to, to, to cross through Iraq and to go to fight together against the common enemy Israel. But he failed. The Iranians didn't do I agree. Nothing. I agree. And, and then they attacked Basra. But he did it. He was very disappointed. The, the Abu Nidal were caught by the Scotland Guards and they admitted uh, everything. My, my question was more, uh, what do you think of this conspiracy? Of the conspiracy? Yes. Well, he thought he was super clever and he could... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, engineer uh, human behavior. He in Iraq, in Iraq, he did it very well, by the way. And he really believed that because he was very literal. He believed that because Khomeini is talking about Israel all the time and the Zionists and and Jerusalem, Jerusalem Day, and the, you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand people are going like this. Uh, he thought that that will be will ignite Khomeini's imagination. Ah, okay, Iraq, we finished. They withdrew anyway. Let's go for Palestine. 
He was very, dis he really thought so, and that's why he sent Abu Nidal. There is no question about it today. And uh, he was disappointed. Khomeini really didn't want at the time to conquer uh, Jerusalem, if ever he did. He just wanted to conquer Baghdad. Also. Yeah, eventually Baghdad. Uh, uh, David Newton, former ambassador, Middle East Institute. Just to make a few comments about what you said, uh, based my first uh, impression of Saddam was when I presented credentials, and instead of getting 15 minutes of just nice talk, I got 45 minutes of substance. And my impression was, this is a man who's no fool. There are things he knows. It makes sense. But he obviously thinks everything he says is quite profound and that the, uh, uh, the things he say are quite uneven. I think you have to remember two things. Number one, uh, conspiracy theories are not uh, rare in the Arab world. But secondly, Saddam's experience was on internal politics. And in Iraq, you, you played what I call ultimate politics. And his mirror imaging for the rest of the world was very similar. It was kind of ultimate diplomacy. But everything centered around survival. And you can see the lack of trust with who the people were closest to him, originally his half-brothers. Then he decided he moved them over. He went to his sons. One of them was not stable, as became increasingly clear. He did depend on Kusei, I think, right to the end. But then he, he got a couple of sons-in-law he could depend on. They betrayed him and so forth. And in the end, we even saw some of the half-brothers coming back. So, And at, at times, he even pushed all of these people away and just used senior Tikriti military or political people. So he was constantly rotating. There was no trust uh, at all. Uh, in terms of military, I mean, in his ceaseful efforts for self-improvement, he enrolled in Bucker Military University, right? Now, and admirably, he came in first in his class. <laughs> <laughs> and he then was uh, appointed, he lateral entered into the military as lieutenant general and worked his way up to field marshal. So he obviously thought he was indeed a great military. And in the beginning, I think he did make a lot of those decisions. Uh, but he realized, I think, being uh, sane in that respect, that uh, he could get himself in real trouble and could lose. Uh, Mehran was a perfect example, and I think he, he learned by experience, you better let the better professionals do it and not, uh, uh, and not try to do that. Uh, uh, and I would say just one other thing, I think, since we talked about Kuwait and so forth, I think my personal opinion always has been of the famous meeting with April. This was part of a larger deception operation. He did the same thing with several other ambassadors and convinced them they could leave, that diplomacy would have a, would have a chance. Uh, so I don't think th this man was quite clever. He understood dangers and he understood politics. Uh, but uh, I find uh, your, your paper very reasonable, uh, what you said about him, but I don't find it surprising at, at all the way that he behaved. Thank you very much. Can I get two more questions and we'll, we'll Say both questions, then we'll hold them for the answers. The next, next hand oh, up. There you go. Uh, Dave Ottaway, former Washington Post Middle East correspondent. Uh, I have a question about a commentary and then a question about his relations with his generals. Uh, one of the times I went to, uh, during the war, um, I spent a day with General Maher down at the um, – well, I remember he took me to the uh, Majnoon oil field to show me the defenses around um, that they had built up. But the, the point is, we got down there. He told my handler, who had brought me from Baghdad, to stay at his headquarters. And it was just he and I and one other person who didn't speak English in the car. And he started talking out against Saddam Hussein in a matter that I thought was going to get me into trouble because I was sure the car was bucked. Anyway. He thought he was a lousy decision maker. He thought he, that, that, uh, that he'd gotten the country into real trouble. And um, he told me, he thought he was a coward. He told me he'd come down one time to the front to visit and there was a shell had hit a mile away and, uh, and he had jumped into a culvert and hid. And he, I, I just couldn't believe it. He went on and on and on about uh, how he disliked and thought little of his command capabilities. Now, my question is, Maher, of course, ended up in a, t in a, in a, in a helicopter accident 
uh, so-called accident. No, 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 no. My hair is still alive today. His brother was killed. He, okay, he's, the, he's, ma- the core commander is still alive. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, so he's his telling, younger brother. He's, a, he's, he's telling me. My question is, what were the? How much dissonance was there among his generals? Uh, and thinking like Maher did, although he would only say it to a foreigner in a car when when there was nobody who was going to report back on it. Uh, how much dissonance was there um, in in his general among his generals? And did Maher reflect a larger view among his professional corps people that he was a lousy general, Saddam? Well, <clears throat> I'll leave it to the opinions of those who've studied uh, to this. But I mean, I'm, most of the, the tapes, obviously, you're not going to find generals telling Saddam to his face in these tapes that he's a lousy decision maker, and the documents aren't likely to say the same thing. The interviews that we've done the last few years with some of the senior generals uh, from that period um, you kind of break it down into a professional class and a political class in general. And the professional class say now, obviously, um, that there was always great, great concern with Saddam, even in the late 70s, with the manipulation of the per- personnel promotion system, the selection of commanders, the rapid promotion of, of uh, Kerala, and, and others that were just, it was breaking with this model that the professionals had of themselves as military men in service to the state. Now, whether or not, you know, I, I'm actually surprised to hear the level at which somebody would say that. Um, I mean, I, it, it sounds shocking even by today's uh, uh, distance from the events. But, again, they indicated there was this, this distinction, but, you know, you kept your mouth shut for all kinds of reasons. Uh, some professional, some out of fear. Um, I, just one thing on the car, the joke after in the 90s was that the Republican Guard officers all had staff cars, all had, you know, state-provided cars, and they said they were the best-maintained vehicles in Iraq. They knew that because every Friday they had to go in during the cycle, the down day, they all went in for maintenance. Um, you know, snicker, snicker, that's when the batteries had to be changed out for the listening devices. So there was, no, there was no doubt they were being recorded, at least in the mines later on during the regime. So that's why it's an interesting story, but I, I don't know whether there's opinions on. After 91, there were uh, some of the generals, especially those who, who fled Iraq, that uh, made their opinions like uh, General Khazraji or General Samurai. Uh, uh, for example, another general who didn't flee but m- made his opinion about Saddam, General Sabah Sultan, who was uh, deputy chief of staff, was arrested and was then killed. He paid for. Over lunch. Uh, exactly, just same experience. We, we have a major general here. Here, wait. Uh, he was from the same village of Saddam Hussein, General Mahad. And he was the father of um, um, the Saddam's daughter. Saddam's daughter. Yeah. Saddam's son he was in son in law. Yeah. He was in law. Right, in law. Related to. And he even he considered himself one of the sheikhs of the, the tribe in the village. And he always talked bad about Saddam Hussein, him and Kerala, and everyone knows it. It was famous. Kerala minister of defense. Minister of defense that was killed in the airplane. In the ah, the, his father, his father, yes, sorry, not Adnan, sorry. And so General Mahar is a very exceptional case. I don't think that you can generalize what he said to other generals just because he was so close to Saddam and was known to be able to criticize Saddam. Other questions? Mark, and then uh, back here in the back. Uh, Nigel, I'm sorry. Uh, Nigel Ashton, I just wanted to raise a a methodological question, which normally people sort of think, oh, my God, this is going to be dull. But I think it's quite fundamental Um, here. And Kevin kind of highlighted it at the outset. We've got this sort of fabulous treasure trove of Iraqi records, vast amounts of material. But what have we got elsewhere to balance it up? I've got some material in Jordan. We've got some material uh, in the United States, bits and pieces of material elsewhere. The big danger here is that when we have a lot of sources from one particular player, we always assign agency to that particular player. You know, we assume because we've got all these records, we can, we can follow it through. Is there not a kind of alternative narrative of the, the 1980s here where 
Um, Saddam takes one disastrous initiative at the start, and then he spends the whole of the rest of the decade on the defensive. And actually, for initiatives in the region, we've got to look elsewhere. There was a mention, for instance, of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Now, now there was a grand plan to refashion the map of the region, to change everything. Um, so I think we just have to be a bit cautious. Uh, I think Kevin kind of pointed us towards that at the outset in how we use these things and assuming that, you know, because Saddam's having some private discussion about his attitudes towards Israel or so forth, that we translate this through into grand plans about what he may or may, may not do in the long run. No, I, 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 can, I, I would, I would oh, concur okay. with that. I mean, I'll, I'll let Hal, who we've talked about this long into the night before, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I would just make a couple of points. Uh, I like to compare these records to the first tranches that come out of Moscow after the end of the Cold War, where you have to realize that what we, what, what they have at the CRC is quite a lot, but presumably that's just a small sliver of sort of the total body of uh, Iraqi documentation. And then what you can actually look at and research is just a tiny, tiny fraction of that. So we have a very good start here, but it's going to take years and years of, of research to sort of get around to, to something approximating truth. Um, and the other is that uh, the way I like to think about it is that you're, you're sort of triangulating on a regional history, right? So thanks to the, the work that the National Security Archive has done, we've been able to study American policy in, in some detail for a few years now. Now we're getting a chance to do the Iraqi side of the equation. Presumably we, we have work coming out of Europe and the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union as well. So we're sort of building up to a, a better rounded history of something that was very much an event in regional history and not just bilateral history as well. Let me, let me, Can I answer that? Real quick, Amatsi, I want to go to the two questions right here. Well, uh, if you build all you know about those documents, you are lost, completely lost. You have no chance of understanding anything. But if you studied Saddam and not just Saddam, the Iraqi the system under the Ba'ath Party for 25 years, and if you had tens of thousands of documents, open source documents, coming from Baghdad, and if you learn how to read them, I hope I did, I don't know, uh, then when you couple it with that material, then you get some added value. But I'll put it this way. Nothing that I saw really uh, surprised me or was new to me. Nothing. It was very funny because it was more extreme than I thought. And it was very strange sometimes. But everything that I saw, I know anyway. It's that these sources are giving you much more intimate look into things. That's it. So... Like, I'll give an example. That Saddam had a huge problem with the Shia, didn't know exactly how to deal with them, is obvious. You can see it from the open sources endlessly. I'm now publishing a book, a whole book about that. Saddam and the Shia, Saddam and Islam and the Shia. But when he is sitting, and, and so I could give you the whole picture, generally speaking, cor I believe correct, even based on what I saw in the documents. Pesach, when he saw the, the military part, it didn't give him a lot new. He knew it all from open sources because they published it. They made it public, and it usually is quite good quality. When I listen to a conversation between Saddam and tribal sheikhs in Baghdad, Shi'i tribal sheikhs in Saddam city, today Sadr city, uh, Madinat Sadr, and he's saying to them, and that was Oh, wait a minute, this was, I, that knocked me out completely. And he said to them, who were the people who revolted against me? Now, I know who they were, and they knew, and he did. But he wanted them to tell him who they were. And they said to him, two kinds of people revolted against you in the Intifada, in the revolt of March 1991. The, the meeting is a, a month or two later. And they said, two kinds, just, just these kinds. Kind number one, Abna Ummihim. Abna Ummihim. Uh, these are riffraff, uh, namely people who, who uh, don't know who their father is. Uh, and uh, only their mothers are mentioned. He is uh, uh, Musa ibn uh, Halima, whatever, or ibn, uh, ibn Zainab, whatever. They're, they're not Musa, uh, uh, Musa ibn Ali. Or these guys, and they are riffraff. But Im immediately they realize that something is wrong. He goes, he is ibn Ummihim himself. 
So immediately they say, oh, well, it doesn't mean that they are bad people, but, and they say, I know, you know, they are not bad people, but it means that they didn't have a fatherly figure, and so all of a sudden. And then they say the other one, other kind of people are Muhannathin. Muhannathin? Muhannathin is, uh, is uh, transvestites. They revolted against you. And I say to myself, well, that's new to me. That was new to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, transvestites? Oh, these guys who are dressing like women and have uh, 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 lipstick and uh, uh, dye their hair yellow and red and so, yes, yes. I, he said, I hate transvestites. I hate them. Kill them. So they say, but maybe this is just, uh, it, will be a, uh, it will be a sin, haram, yani, to kill them. So he says, no, 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 no. It's a sin to keep them alive. Kill them, al rukbati on my responsibility. Kill them, kill them, like that. And he's, wow, he's shouting. That's new. You see what I mean? But that he had a huge problem with the Shia, and especially after the 1991 revolt, my God, there is so much information about it. But that, I get. So it's not like we are born to, we are newly born historians of Iraq. As Pesach studied the military for 30 years, I studied Saddam, for, or the, the system, for 30 years. So when you have that background, you can, and when you just base on the documents, you can learn a lot, but you also have to refer yourself to sources that came before, written by Phoebe Marr and by other people, uh, like myself and like Phoebe, who, uh, you know, we, we have been working in for many, many years. Good segue. Phoebe, you had the next question, then Mark. And then Mark. So much has been right said. I just, I really, uh, I really wanted to weigh in and and agree with them. Bec uh, agree with what's been said. The documents are e extremely valuable. And I tried to suggest yesterday they 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 need to be supplemented by by memoirs, particularly in Arabic. Nobody's mentioned uh, Wafik Samarai, whose memoirs and the an interview with, with whom I found extremely interesting, and the oral history, which I know that, that you all are doing uh, some of, because uh, obviously people are, are, are still alive and in, uh, now may be willing to talk, although hindsight is, you know, is not the same as, as what you said at, uh, at the time. I, I was just going to th throw in on the run-up to, to the war, I, I, I think we should do, do keep a, 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 a nuanced uh, point of view about the, the, the autocracy uh, and, and so on, because many people at a, at a much lower level than those who saw Saddam every day uh, uh, told me that th th this whole issue of Iran um, <laughs> was studied by everybody um, in, in the government and outside, and it was, a, it was a subject of debate. And after all, there was a revolution there. Um, there was going to be problems with the Kurds. There was going to be possibly problem with the, uh, the, the Shia. And I, I can't help but think that many of these reports actually got to Saddam himself. So the whole idea that, that he, he alone, he, he was the, the only one that, that ever said anything and, and, and so on, I think w we have to put that in a little bit of perspective. What struck me in reading some of these documents with this perception that you couldn't uh, say anything to Saddam, you couldn't suggest it and so on, was the fact that in, in, in a number of ways there were some people who found a way actually <laughs> uh, to get a different point of view in? So I just want to—I I just want to add there. There are a lot of other um, uh, documents and oral sources out there to supplement this, and they really—they do need to be uh, assessed. Absolutely, Mark. Just a quick yeah, microphone, please. I mentioned to a few people one-on-one, -on -one, but th there's a whole set of uh, books. Uh, published by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Historical Office, like 50 of them or something like that. 44 about, volumes. Yeah. yeah, about the Iran-Iraq War. So there's a, a great deal of material available on the Iranian side as well. I think that that should be added into this collection. Absolutely. Other questions? I think the general up front has a question. I hear a lot about American help that they could have given to Iraq during the war. But we never felt, I mean, from our point of view in the air defense, we never felt any of that, that help. We couldn't, we didn't hear about it, we didn't, you know, they, they could have given help. 
And the only the only um, indication I think I could uh, think of of that help uh, is that America was happy with Iraq. When we uh, had killed some American soldiers um, mistakenly in the um, Gulf, there was um, a, a ship. USS, USS Stark, 87. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there wasn't a strong reaction from America, and we'd given um, compensation. And the second thing, I think that Shibir al Aysami, he was a, a high leader of, of the Ba'ath Party and the revolutionary leadership. No, no, national Ba'ath national Ba Ba Party. He had uh, said to Saddam Hussein that he was not happy with the war against Iran. He said, right now, maybe the international community is with us, but it might not last very long. And the last point I want to make is when Saddam Hussein would build his palaces or buildings, he would, you know, he would put the, the letter Saad, Saddam, the, as the first letter, like the keystone. Or so that when people would come after 5,000 years or in the future, and they and they open up the time capsule or whatever, they would see my they would see my name. That's why I think uh, even trying to find those types of um, uh, recordings, you know, of course, won't give uh, you know won't give the complete um, view of Saddam Hussein. Uh, you know, there's probably things that he wanted people to remember him by. That's the reason why he said it and it was recorded. And that's why I said yesterday he, he his, his, his personality was a lot more harsh or decisive. And, and not very democratic with the leadership when he was in those meetings. There was a certain type of prestige that he was looking after when he was in these larger me meetings. Thank you. Any other questions? David in the back. Sure. Uh, I, just a question and a comment. Uh, the comment will be just a shameless plug. Some of the uh, transcripts which were mentioned today are in the Saddam tapes, uh, which just came out, the story of the, tra uh, the uh, transvestites and a few others. So if you're not able to make it to the uh, CRRC, uh, this book, which we've recently edited, is something that you'll be able to purchase online and read some of these fascinating transcripts. Uh, the second is, um, I, I wonder if it's a greater concern. Uh, of, of course, the Iraqi record should not be read uh, should not be read alone. There needs to be a lot of context, and I think this this conference has done a good job of that, bringing in scholars talking about the Soviet records and the Russian records and the French records and so on, and of course the Israeli experiences as well. Uh, my far greater fear um, is that most of the narratives uh, of the Iran-Iraq war and of other issues dealing with Iraq are far too much from the U.S., uh, from an American-centric perspective. Uh, when I look at the Iran-Iraq war, for instance, um, I, I see transcripts of Saddam uh, being furious uh, that the West is stealing from him his glory, uh, the, the glorious Iraq Iraqi victory over the Iranians, uh, saying the, the Americans are taking credit for this by their naval actions in the Gulf, uh, by the intel that they've passed along, this kind of thing. Uh, this is ludicrous. It's my glory, uh, and it's a U.S. Zionist plot to, uh, to steal my thunder. And I can easily see how someone even less conspiratorial than Saddam could come to these conclusions. So I wonder if sometimes we take things a little out of perspective. I, I think the greater fear, from my perspective, is, is that our story is way too U.S.-centric, and I think these Iraqi records will help, uh, will help offset that, actually. And, and I'm happy to hear any reactions to that. Can't help but concur with all that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's one of the points that uh, I've tried to make in some of the work I do with this is that 
uh, as with intelligence, I mean, American assistance to Iraq is, is a very small piece of the puzzle during the 1980s. If you look at uh, the amount of arms that are being sold by the Soviets and the French uh, and the Brazilians and so on, if you Chinese. look at the, yeah, if you look at where most of the dual use equipment is coming from, if you look at where most of the money is coming from, it, it's invariably from sources other than the United States. There's a very strong case to be made that American diplomatic support helped Saddam maintain some of these alliances, but the, there was a whole world out there and very few people wanted the Iranians to win. So it wasn't as though Saddam was dependent uh, on his relationship with the United States to the degree that sometimes comes out in some of the literature that, that is based primarily on American sources. Any other questions? Sir, right here in the back. Hi, it's, it's been great. I'm Grady Dunn with Navy Warfare Development Command. Um, uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times. Are there any perspectives on S Saddam's perspective on the tanker wars? Uh, that's what I want to ask you about. Um, not, I believe, in the documents released for this conference, but in the documents in the CRC, there's extensive discussions. Um, in fact, some of the material that I've worked with for a, a, a still unpublished uh, manuscript on this period was the discussions beginning in 82 about the value of expanding the war into the Gulf. And it, so there are, there are long discussions about what a tanker war might look like um, and the utility of an economic front, if you will, on the war after uh, the summer of, or summer fall of 82, uh, that discussion came up quite heavily um, um, in, in Iraq. So yeah, I, I, in the broader collection, just not what was available for this, the limited selection that was published at this, at this conference. In the very back. Yes, uh, My name is uh, Mohammed Baban. Um, I'm from Iraq and uh, I work at the CRC also. I just wanted to say, um, Two things. First, uh, the tanker war is mentioned in the same meeting that Shibli al Aysami, uh, the Pan Arab uh, member, uh, senior member of, Ba'ath, uh, of the Pan Arab Ba'ath Command, um, he warned Saddam of the tanker war and he said that our Navy is weak. The Iranians uh, uh, can crush our Navy um, and they will start, if they start a tanker war, we will lose it. And Saddam says uh, that will be even better. We'll they, they will bring in uh, our international community towards us. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and, and Azzet also says, yeah, that will benefit our, our, uh, our Arabic, our Arab support uh, towards uh, the war since they will attack Arab uh, tankers. Uh, the second thing, if I may say about the records, is that they carry historic value and that, you know, everyone in here um, has great experience with all these situations, but my generation, especially in Iraq, we know nothing about it. Uh, all we know is taught from Saddam's point of view, and even those in Iran are taught from Iranian point of view. So our generation is cut off from this, uh, from everything that's said and everything in the CRRC documents. So I think that's, that's where uh, the main importance comes for, the, uh, for these documents, that for uh, people like me and my generation, we uh, will be able to know what went wrong and how to avoid such things, hopefully, in the future. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I know we could go on forever, especially those of us who, who work in this every day, which is most of the people in this room, or think about it every day. There's always something else to say. I just want to close by thanking my panel members. The papers are fantastic. Uh, somebody's been researching this. I can't wait to dive into them and, and mine the footnotes and, and, and look for all those themes that, I, that I've missed in, in my prior work. Um, I want to steal a quote out of the foreword to the Saddam Tapes book that I think is appropriate for this, and it, it fits the, the, the Faulkner quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And I think that's exactly what this conference is about. This stuff is very much alive and well. There's a lot left to be learned. So with that, I'll turn it back over to our hosts. Before you leave, uh, the, for those of you who haven't gotten to meet, I'm Lori Fenner. I'm the director of the CRRC. I want to thank you all. I've learned very, very much over the past few days in this interaction between the documentary sources that come from various locations, not just ours, as well as uh, your experiences have added greatly to, to my understanding. Um, I think we can only go up from here uh, to do more, and we've captured some of these, uh, these conversations, obviously, with, with what the Woodrow Wilson Center has done. Let me add my thanks to all of the panelists over the past few days and also to all of you in the, in the audience 
audience who participated. Um, but I'd like to say a special thanks to the Woodrow Wilson Center and the staff, particularly Pete and Tim, and I know there's very many more behind the scenes who helped, and also to our staff, David Palkey. None of this would have been happening at all if it weren't for David, as well as the historical um, effort by, by Ida, but also uh, some of our new people. And Mohammed just spoke up. He's been a real boon to us, helping us with translations, and Jessica and Christopher, and I think uh, Daniel is still here, and Steve is still here. So um, if you have a chance to say thank you to those people who worked over the past uh, more than eight months, but for my staff over the past six weeks or so, weekends and holidays and nights and everything else, that would be great if you just give them a little pat on the back. I'm going to turn this over to Chris, uh, Christian before you leave. Thank you from me. I can just say thank you to all of you as well, um, to my staff, but especially our colleagues at the CRC, headed by Laurie, David, Mohamed, uh, Chris, and Jessica. Um, thank you all. Thanks to all of the speakers, uh, to Kevin for sharing an amazing last panel. We've had a really rich two and a half days. Uh, as Laurie mentioned, we're transcribing the discussions here and uh, hope to make this available. I think there are lots of uh, eyewitness statements that I think will add immensely to, uh, to the history. Uh, we are also planning, of course, to publish the conference paper, so uh, we will be in touch with the authors uh, shortly about um, the publication process. Uh, let me thank uh, Mike Van Dusen, the center's um, uh, uh, executive vice president, for making it all happen at our end, and with that, uh, thanks to everybody. Um, hopefully see you again soon at another one of these. Bye-bye.